My name is Sadeh Shawalkar. Uh, I'm a senior security engineer at Tala, joined with uh, Swapnil, Swapnil Bhalude, who is the CTO of Tala. Uh, this evening, we're going to talk about protecting your web applications from MageCard. So, uh, first of all, uh, we're going to start by going over the evolution of web architecture. So, in the last decade, this is somewhat how your web application looked like. You had uh, your first party web server, which would, which would serve HTML, simple content, down to your PCs, which would most likely be desktops, and they would run this HTML. It would be server heavy, there would be not much execution which would be happening on the desktop side, and this was the classic web server client architecture, roughly 10, 15 years ago. Um, nowadays, we have more mobile devices, and as a result, some architecture has changed in the sense that we have a lot of dependencies on third parties, content providers, and open source, uh, open source services like jQuery. Uh, as a result, we can see that there's a large increase in the number of third-party devices and third-party services that we use. And it's no longer mainly HTML. It's become JavaScript that executes on the client side. This is a big shift because nowadays, a lot of the code, which is JavaScript, is now executing on your desktops. It's executing on your mobile devices. Any endpoints, they are running code. This did not take place 10, 15 years ago. And this is one big change which has taken place in the last 15 years. Um, let me double click on that and go in to show how a web application works nowadays. A web application will have code, mainly JavaScript. It'll have images, it'll have fonts, style sheets, and so forth. Let's dig deeper into how the code and the images are actually fetched, and let's look into the supply chain. When we say that code is fetched or code is loaded, it's pretty much loaded from a combination of first-party servers, third-party servers, and these third-party servers load more dependencies, which become fourth-party servers. So basically, you're running code from third parties which are piggybacking code and running it on your web application. The fourth parties could even load more and it, it goes on. So this is roughly how some simple JavaScript runs on your desktop, on your mobile phones. You have third parties which load more. Practically, it gets a lot more messy. You have uh, on the left, on the left, you have first parties, which will indirectly load third parties. Third parties will load fourth parties. And this all takes place through different physical servers. So you will have different locations, different physical entities, different organizations, which are all hosting these services. For example, CDNs, jQuery, Google, and way more non well-known organizations, which would be hosting simple fonts, simple services. All of them will be actually running code on your application. This is known as piggybacking, where fourth parties load as a result of third parties, which will run on your application. And one thing that happens is you are indirectly giving trust to third parties and fourth parties to run code on your application. And believe it or not, if one of them gets breached, one of them loads malicious code onto those servers, that server's code runs on your application. It runs on your website, and it'll be running on your desktops, your mobile phones. Uh, a little bit of stats on roughly how often and you know these things happen. Uh, a recent report which was published 
uh, by Tala Security, we found that on average for the Alexa top thousand, the average third party websites is 31. Uh, out of that, close to around 63% of them load external JavaScript that is not hosted in your servers. So that's basically 60% of JavaScript is run from servers that you do not control. And um, mainly that leads to 98% or pretty much everyone on the Alexa top thousand have at least one DOM sync present in their web application. That is quite risky and that leads to a vector of attack which, uh, yeah, which we're mainly gonna talk about. Um, these are some companies which have been a recent victim of such compromises. We described third and fourth party compromises. Uh, in the US especially, Delta, Ticketmaster, and uh, similar companies have been breached. And most infamous of last year was British Airways. Um, British Airways got breached by an infamous group called Magecart, and that's what you know, we're mainly gonna talk about. Um, Magecart is actually a, it's an umbrella term for a group of hackers. And it is the largest group of hackers that deals with client-side attacks. They're mainly focused in employing attacks such as form jacking, web skimming technologies, anything that they can use to steal credit cards. And they will generally target websites and applications which have a lot of credit card information. So generally, e-commerce websites, airlines, any form of digital commerce where payment is made quite often, they're most likely gonna target them. Um, let's go into how MageCard works. We have talked a bit about how the web application, this is pretty much simple uh, JavaScript which will be running in your computer or in your cell phone. We have here an example of uh, an external JavaScript which will be loaded. Here on the left hand side is a third party server which is beyond your control. You're fetching a script here, modernizer.js, uh, as a dependency. The way in which MageCart will generally try and breach your web application is by, first of all, breaching the third party. They will use a known vulnerability hack into the third party. Whatever exploit is available to them, they will use, and they will try and inject their malicious code, most likely a credit card skimming code or something which will steal some data, and keep the original functionality of the expected code, in this case modernizer.js, intact. This way they're just piggybacking some of their malicious code onto an action working code. When your web application loads this modernizer.js, you get the code, the legitimate code, plus the malicious code onto your web application, and you execute it. Once it executes, the legitimate behavior takes place, as well as the malicious code, it executes and steals your credit card information and lastly, it'll send it to an attack server of its choice. Couple of points to note here. Because the legitimate code runs in your browser, you will not observe any difference. The credit card payment will go through if you're on any e-commerce website, the transactions will go through successfully. There's no way to know that someone took a copy and sent it to an attacker's web server you won't understand until your credit card is charged by someone else. And a bigger thing to note is that as an owner of a website, as an owner of your web application, this is beyond your control. Your application did not get hacked. Your customer's browser, your customer's device did not get breached. It was a third party which was hosting a website that got breached. 
And that is something which is quite scary to web application owners, e-commerce sites, that this is something which is beyond their control. MageCard has been in the news for its high profile breaches and uh, a recent report by Symantec has said that close to 5,200 websites are actually breached and attacked by this form of attack, which, which is generally called as form jacking. And it's all over the news. If you search it up in Google News, you'll see pretty much every other day a famous website across the world is breached. I'm going to hand it over to Swapnil, who's going to show a demo. All right, who doesn't love a demo? So what we're going to do, this is the scenario, this is the real life scenario with MageCard, where you have a MageCard breaching into your third party JavaScript, and uh, your uh, data is being skimmed by the malicious code that in, they injected. So for the purpose of the demo, we have created a dummy website. Uh, let's just look at that first. So just a bank website where your money is safe. Uh, you have your login and password. So for the purpose of the demo, we'll try to see how MageCard like attack can uh, steal your login information. So let's look into Chrome Inspector tools here. And if we look at the network tab, I'm filtering this network tab by JavaScript only requests. And you see that there are a bunch of JavaScript is getting loaded. A lot of them from the first party and some of them from third party such as uh, ajax.googleaps.com. So this is your supply chain. This is the supply chain for uh, this particular website. So what we'll do is target one of these uh, JavaScript files, let's just say hammer.min.js, and we'll simulate uh, like injection of uh, MageCard like snippet into this JavaScript and see how the MageCard like attack works. Of course, we don't have access to ajax.googleaps.com, uh, so we'll uh, we'll use uh, man in the browser type of attack here to modify this, uh, this JavaScript. So essentially going back to the real scenario, uh, again, we don't have access to the left hand side there. So what we'll do essentially is uh, not worry about the left hand side. And instead of modifying the JavaScript outside, we'll modify it in the browser. And that's how the attack will work. Uh, all right, let's get into it. So I'm going to use Chrome's uh, feature called uh, local override. So I'm going to locally override this hammer.min.js and inject the JavaScript code. So the JavaScript code that will be injected, and believe me or not, this is very simple code. What it is doing here is uh, looking for the login form and waiting for the submit action to take place. And when that action happens, it uh, records the username and password value and sends it out as a J AJAX request to the server. So this is how MageCard essentially started. This was very basic code. That's how they started. That's how their code was. They are evolving uh, uh, a lot right now so that this actually code is very generic. So this code right now, if you see it, is very specific to the demo website that we have. But these days, uh, the code is very generic so that they can run the code on any, any website that they are not even targeting. So they have generic de detection for uh, input values such as uh, your credit card uh, uh, number field, your CC field, and things like that. Um, so we're going to use this code. Uh, all right, so this is the original code. All we're going to do is append our code here. and try to go back to console and type in our any username password. All right, with the help of demo guards. Uh, oh, sorry. Huh? Oh, yeah, true.
OK. OK, so what you're seeing here on the console log is uh, uh, statements coming from the script that we injected. So hammer.min.js is what we targeted. It's showing that the mesh card code is injected. And this is a friendly message here, which is saying that that particular script, the code that's there in that particular script, now has access to your username and password. Now, if you go to your network tab here and look for Ajax requests, you'll see that this code is now going to this particular server that is supposed to be an attacker server. So this is your username and password towards the bottom here. And it's going to this server that is controlled by the, supposedly controlled by the attacker. Right? So this is really simple if you think about it. Uh, but it's so powerful because uh, this is happening day by day. If you search for mage card in the news, it's happening every day. There are thousands and thousands of websites that are getting hacked uh, day by day. So, so this concludes the mage card style uh, attack. And uh, you might think now, how do you protect against it, right? So essentially, roughly, there are three ways you can protect against it. And uh, the most recommended way is using the HTTP security standards. So W3C, or web app sec, has been working really hard for protecting against a lot of attacks. And uh, client said uh, attacks are one of them. So there are two, uh, two specifications that are released currently. Uh, one is content security policy and sub-resource integrity that can help your web applications protect against image card like attacks. So just out of curiosity, how many of us uh, here have heard of uh, content security policy or SRI working on it? OK, quite a bunch. OK, good to know. So, uh, so this is highly recommended uh, uh, approach that you take based on a lot of uh, articles and studies that are uh, published by entities like IBM, IRIS, uh, PCI, RH, ISAC. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, yeah, it's the most uh, recommended way. There are a couple others. One is cross-origin iframe uh, technique, where what you essentially do is uh, take your sensitive information, uh, wherever this information is coming from, such as the credit card form. You put it in an iframe, which is a cross-origin iframe. And what happens is that even if, you're, if you have a compromised JS in your main uh, application, it cannot access the forms data. So you're protected against it. There are some limitations here. It's not a foolproof technique, but it's a technique. And uh, unlike the security HTTP headers, uh, where you are protected against a wide variety of attacks, this is very specific to limited number of attacks. And the last one, uh, what you'll see is JavaScript versus JavaScript, where essentially what you're doing is you have some kind of a protector script. Uh, think of it like uh, one example of a protector script is uh, where the JavaScript overrides all the DOM APIs, such as you know HTML script element, HTML iframe element, so that it becomes sort of like a firewall. So before you load, let's just say, script element, uh, this protector script will get a call back, and you then decide whether that script should be loaded or not. So essentially, that script is loaded, has to load first, of course, because it's going to provide you the protection. And then as the DOM loads, it can decide whether uh, uh, some content should be loaded or not. So uh, I know a lot of you are heard of uh, content security policy, but just for the interest of uh, uh, people who haven't, content security policy essentially is a uh, W3C security standard. It's continuously evolving. They're adding more and more things around it. And it is implemented essentially as a HTTP header. So you have your content security policy that you insert into an HTTP header, and the browser will essentially read it before your DOM is loaded. They will uh, understand it and enforce it. Um, uh, what it does essentially is it locks down all the web resource origins, and I'll get into that in the next slide, and content that you're loading into your web page. Uh, the great thing, the reason this uh, standard is being developed is because you want to prevent execution of unintended content into your web uh, app or application. Um, and the great thing is it is uh, implemented and supported by most browsers. So double clicking on that, uh, if you uh, really consider your web page or web context, essentially, there are two or three kinds of uh, content that comes or goes out, right? Uh, there is an inflow of content or uh, uh, data or even code, right? For example, your service worker, web workers, scripts, iframes, fonts, this may come from first parties, third party, and this is all coming into your web page. Then you have some static content that you're fetching from 
first party, such as your you know, inline scripts, for example. And there is an outflow of content to, for example, the user might be submitting data through forms or AJAX requests, or you might iframe your own web page into another you know, uh, origins uh, or another web page. So essentially, uh, as an example, what does a CSP policy look like? So it's essentially a key value pair where the key is uh, standard, uh, uh, it's defined by the spec, and values a, uh, so, uh, a bunch of values of resource origins where you want to load the content from. Uh, so uh, what you're seeing at the bottom is an example CSP policy, one of the best CSP policies uh, of github.com. So if you look at the policy, essentially the first part is the key, which is defines the kind of content you're loading. Uh, for example, the third line, which is connect SRC, which refers to your uh, AJAX request, for example, or any WebSocket request. And you specify all the domains where you're loading this content from. Um, so there are two types of content. Uh, actually, the keywords here, one is the domain itself. And some, con uh, some keywords are, sorry, there are some uh, values that are uh, standard, such as you know, self. Self means you're loading it from the uh, same domain as you. Um, so that's essentially how a CSP policy looks like. Uh, and to explain it all in one picture, what you have is the same web page that we had. And what you're seeing here in the Chrome's inspector tool window is that this page is now protected with this content security policy, where the frame SRC says none. That means there is no frames that are allowed to be loaded into this page. But let's just say there was some kind of uh, injection, let's just say through some mesh card like attack where somebody's trying to inject a frame, the browser will respect your policy and it will say that I cannot load this frame because your policy doesn't allow it. This is very powerful. So, so this is content security policy in, in one picture. Um, so uh, along with CSP, there is actually one more standard that can help you with uh, mesh card like attack and it's called sub-resource integrity. So this essentially is a very uh, sort of uh, strict uh, implementation. Uh, it's a W3C, W3C standard and what essentially it does is that uh, it lets you specify the hash of the code that you're loading from a third party, uh, either a script or a st uh, style source. And that hash is respected by the browser. So giving you a quick, quick example which will make sense is that you're loading a script for, uh, which is loading from example.com, some script, right? And you're specifying the integrity in the tag itself. And that integrity has to match at the runtime. If it doesn't, the browser will outright block the execution of, uh, execution of that script. So now, uh, in the first demo, we saw how the mesh card like attack works. But now let's see how standards like CSP and SRI can help you protect against these attacks. It's a little hard to do with one hand. Okay, great. So going back to our Safe Bank a website. Uh, so this is still running, the attack is still working. So what we have done different is now we have installed a CSP policy on this application. And let's see how it helps protect against the attack. So if I go back to Chrome Inspector tools here and refresh the page, you'll see that now this page is being served with a content security policy, right? So this is coming as a HTTP header. Now this is respected by the browser. So let's try that attack again. And again, fingers crossed. All right. So what happened here now is that that code still executed. But if you notice now, the browser is saying that, hey, I cannot connect to 
this particular server because your CSP policy doesn't allow me to. So what's happening is that essentially, even though your third party is hacked with mage card like attack, the attacker still has to exfiltrate that data to its own server, right? But you are specifying a CSP policy where attacker server is not part of the CSP policy. So the browser is blocking that request. So you have now successfully blocked the attack. So if you uh, look at the network tab here, It's a little. All right. So this network request, which uh, which is the exfiltration request, as you can see, the browser is telling you is blocked because of uh, your content security policy here in the status column. So this is how CSP can help protect against uh, match card like attack. But now, if you notice, uh, go, going back to the console. The first two console log here, they tell you that the code is still executing, right? Uh, it's not completely blocked, but the action that's actually stealing the data is blocked, which is a good thing, but if you want to take a step further, uh, you can use uh, sub-resource integ integrity to even block that execution. So what we'll do is now enable SRI on this, uh, on this script, and uh, that should block the attack. All right, um, now let's try that again. Okay, so I'm gonna look at the source for this web page, and if I could look for hammer.js, which, uh, which was previously we targeted. Now if you see uh, in the script tag, what you're seeing is an integrity attributes, which is the source, sub-resource integrity. So it's telling the browser that, hey, the, when you load this script from this third-party server, it better match that uh, hash. If not, then block it. So let's try that uh, attack again because now we have modified the JavaScript and hopefully it will uh, not work. Um, yeah, actually it's uh, no, not quite. No, it's it's giving me a course error. I don't know why. Um. Yeah, it's rather odd because uh, it should be course enabled. So I think maybe maybe we didn't uh, test this right. But essentially, if you if you know sub resource integrity standard, one of the requirements for SRI to work is that the end server or the application has to support C course, which is the cross origin. And it seems like this is not working because we chose the wrong script here, uh, because this the script doesn't seem to allow course. But if you did try this with something that has course enabled, this will definitely block, uh, block the script for executing. So you won't even see any part of that snippet getting executed. Um, so that's how SRI can protect you against uh, uh, match card like attack. All right, so essentially coming back to the, the uh, three ways that you can protect your web application against uh, uh, mesh cards. So we started with uh, 
uh, the HTTP security headers and let's go into what are the advantages and challenges are with each one of them. So with uh, CSP or SRI essentially, the good thing is that uh, it's the specifications are from coming from the standards committee, Web AppSec or W3C, right? So it's continuously evolving and uh, since they're closely tied with the browser, people who implement uh, browser code, uh, uh, it's a, it's a very, it provides a very solid protection. Uh, and the great thing, of course, is that the, pre uh, the prevention happens at the highest privilege level because browser is sort of like the god, right, when you're executing your web application. Um, uh, it is, of course, hours uh, to code obfuscation. So uh, one of the techniques that uh, MageCard has been doing to prevent static scanners from getting detected is to really obfuscate the code. But the browser is existing at the lowest level. So if you're making a network request, the, the code is already de-obfuscated de and the browser already knows where it's making the request and at that point, they have access to the policy and block the actual request. And good thing is mobile, there is some mobile uh, browser coverage. Um, the challenges, of course, uh, one of the biggest challenge uh, or disadvantage of CSP is that there is no uh, DOM XSS protection. Um, secondly, uh, if you're a big organization, if you have a lot of assets, big, a lot of web assets, um, it's very hard to implement because you actually need a, a big team to maintain all these assets. So automation is a recommended way to go here, but without that, it's very, very hard to maintain the CSP policy because it's not a implement once and done kind of a thing. You have to come continuously go and refer to it. What kind of, uh, actually going before that, one of the features of CSP is that if there is a violation, that is if it blocked something, it will actually report to an endpoint that you specify. So let's just say uh, if you block that hammer.js, uh, or rather the exfiltration request, if you specify an endpoint in your CSP policy that belongs to your organization, uh, they will get a violation saying that, hey, there was a, uh, it's, a it's essentially a report which tells you on web, which web page uh, the uh, request was blocked and with what content, right? So you will get tons and tons of that because of browser extension. It's, it's crazy how much noise you're gonna get. So it's, a, it's kind of a lot of, lot of hard work that's needed to like, you know, uh, maintain CSP policies for a lot of assets. Um, then you might think that you implemented CSP policy, yeah, you vetted the domains that are part of the policy, but what if they go rogue after you have deployed your CSP policy, right? So you need to continuously uh, know that the domains that are whitelisted in your policy are not gone rogue. Um, then of course domain reputation comes into play. Where are you fetching your contents from? Because of uh, things like tag management, depending on your uh, location, they might load stuff from uh, uh, servers that you don't even know about, right? Um, so that, that makes it very complicated. Uh, first party compromise is also a challenge. And uh, of course, as I mentioned earlier, there is just too much, uh, too much noise um, that you get from it. So Siddhesh and I have spent like the last two years in dealing with these challenges. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough job. Um, then you come back to cross-origin cross iframe. And just a little bit uh, work there is that you have to restructure your code in the sense that you have to move everything that you want to protect against third party to and different iframe, which may work. But if you consider functionality, it doesn't always work. And the biggest problem with that is that it's not foolproof because if you consider, if you have a third party compromise in your DOM and if you're loading an iframe later on, which is protected because of this cross origin feature that the browser has, that compromised JavaScript can always prevent that iframe from loading and skin it with their own iframe. So uh, let's just say you're using Stripe, for example, right? Stripe uses an iframe to protect their, your pay payment information because it's loaded in a uh, cross-origin iframe. But however, you can actually totally, that third party, if there is a third party, it can totally prevent that iframe from loading and it can replace it with something that looks like Stripe's uh, form. And then you're submitting data and you have no idea what's going on, right? It's exfiltrated already. So, so there is a lot of, uh, there is that kind of problem there. And JavaScript versus JavaScript, actually, one of the biggest thing here is, uh, uh, well, the second point actually takes the precedence here is that it operates at the same privilege as an attacker. So you're trying to use JavaScript to protect against JavaScript. You're at the same playground, same, you're playing at the same playground, which is not good. You need something, if you're protecting something, you need to be at a higher level. So that, in that sense, if you, this is just basic security, it's just not a good idea to use a JavaScript to protect against third-party JavaScript compromises. And not to mention that it has to load first, 
there is a lot of performance uh, related problems there because typically what happens is that you end up overloading a lot of DOM interfaces which, which just uh, causes a lot, of, uh, a lot of complications. So, so that's the limitation there. Uh, yeah, and that's all I had. Uh, uh, on this.